we've got Mayo footballer Lee Keegan with us on the line uh, this morning. Good morning to you, Lee. How are things? It's good, lads. How are you? How are things? All good, thanks. Uh, we must start uh, with Andy Moore, and, and the first thing that strikes me is that he's a brave man to retire on All Ireland Football final week. Uh, Andy wants attention from himself. <laughs> That's what he does. <laughs> um, no, no, I think... Um, I know I think Andy made it quite clear about his um the way he was gonna go out uh throughout the year and you know, he he had made it clear that this was gonna be his last year at Mayo. So obviously we knew that, but I mean in terms of seeing it happen and when Andy mentioned the, the WhatsApp when he was even was sad for him, it was probably sad for us to see him go because he's been such a central figure to to the squad, but I suppose to us as players and friends it's it's obviously very sad to see him go and uh, he's been very much part of my time since I come into Mayo, so um Bit disappointed to see him go, but uh, I'm sure we'll see Andy in some way in shape again in terms of coaching, maybe and, and down the line. So hopefully, something to look forward to again. So this was something that he'd obviously told you all about before the season started. That this was one last crack at it. Yeah, I suppose Andy is very open in how he discusses his feelings and how he's going to. I try to stand for the year, and it's, I suppose Andy's a very busy man with his company and his kids and his family outside of GA as well. So he's he's a lot going on. So he he made, he made a well document that this is Ted. She's going to be his last year and. And it was, and it was a shame that we couldn't, I suppose, bring him to, to the final this weekend. Uh, Andy's very aware that there's a lot of potential sharks to get through on the way in. We, we got caught out by one of the best uh, a few weeks ago. So, um, yeah, again, it's, it's very sad. It's very, it's just, it's just very disappointing to hear such um, sad news like that. But um, he was such a stalwart and uh, one of the greatest Mayo players that I got to play with and see in my time. And uh, one that I get to look back and fond memories with uh, and learn so much off him and. You know, he was very welcoming to me as a young guy coming into the squad, and he just made every, <coughs> excuse me, every young guy feel very comfortable and brought them into an environment that guys can be competitive and put them put themselves forward for a first starting berth. And Andy wasn't selfish like that; he was very much for the team instead of himself. So, from that, it's going to be a big loss to our to our squad. But um, I wish him all the best in his his next career path. Is, <coughs> is there a sense now that there could be a couple of more retirements coming down the track? Have you met as a group since that Dublin game, like to discuss those sort of things? No, we haven't. No, we just had a couple of days in, days in the beer tree house, um, and there was no talk about retirement. It was just probably more reflecting on the year we had, and I suppose the disappointment of losing the semi. So no, there's been no talk about retirement. I suppose that was the first bit of big news we've got since since the Dublin game. Um, we've been very busy with clubs since. To be honest, we've had we're back up running club championship and had a couple of league games. So there hasn't been really any time to I suppose reflect too much on the Dublin game because. Sometimes it's very easy. You have to go back to your club where they're waiting for you as well as as, uh, as we progress through the year. So, I mean, there's been no talk within the Mayo camp or group yet. We've obviously met up for a few beers after the game, but prior to that, it was, it was just, I suppose, a disappointment and trying to suppose, uh, fill the gaps where it went wrong and how, how, uh, how we could have done better, I suppose. Morning, Lee. Tommy here. Um, Hi, Tommy. Uh, just on Andy... Uh, obviously one of the things that we've talked about in the last 10 years decade talking about is how he's reinvented himself as a footballer he uh, funny enough was a wing back in his early days I'm just wondering like uh, one of the big things was uh, as a as his movement inside it would be kind of like a, a standard setter in terms of what people would talk about around the country mm-hmm. as a half back when you have the ball and you're looking forward what difference did Andy Moore make when he was inside in the inside forward line um, well I suppose for a huge part of for us, I suppose, for the first couple of years, Mayo, particularly the halfback line, were known as a real running team. Uh, as Andy developed through them years as well, his game became more smarter and clever as a corner forward. So his three or four runs to get away from his man made us lift up our head a lot quicker. So that gave us a chance to kick the ball in instead of having to run, head down, run the ball constantly and make us tired towards the end of the game. So Andy could give that more, he just give more option and uh, flexibility to what a half back midfield could do. So if we got our head up, we knew Andy was going to be in five, six, seven yards of space. And he, he did that for the last three or four years constantly. And again, he did in 17 where he got player of the year. He, he just terrorized um, cornerbacks and fullbacks. Um, and he did it in trend. He, and he still doesn't train. He still didn't train this year where. I mean, you look at Andy, you think, you know, this guy is 35 now and, you know, I'm 25, 26, not me now personally. I'm saying guys, yeah. I'm American, and think this is going to be not a bad day for me. I might, you know, get up the pace to run a few bits, but you're constantly on the move because you're trying to chase him. You can't get a hand on him because he, he just got away that two or three yards away from you. As I think it was, it was crazy pace. It was just, it was smart movement and he just gave such an outlet to the guys by us lifting our head. We could just look at Andy knowing that he's free and his man. So, even if he didn't get the ball, he's creating space for someone else to run into. So, in terms of a team player and his and his just total smartness of the game, he he just totally transferred his game the last four, five, six years. And I mean, 
he brought such a different perspective for, for me as a halfback and the guys in the field as well and just gave us such a huge option in particularly in games in Crow Park where you have that bit more extra space with the width of the pitch as well. So, Yeah, I don't think anybody would be surprised to see him involved in a Mayo set-up very shortly indeed. Uh, you mentioned the, the Dublin game there a moment ago, Lee. <coughs> like, I'm sure it's still fairly sore at this moment. You've said to yourself that I'm sure the club commitments have been kind of a welcome distraction away from thinking about it too much. So we'll get into actually kind of what happened, the build-up to that game. And it kind of feels a little bit similar to how we're talking about this week's All-Ireland Final in terms of who's going to mark who because it seems like a nightmare assignment for pretty much all the carry defenders this weekend. In your case, at what point during the week in the build-up to the All-Ireland semi-final do you uh, find out or uh, do you discuss the fact that you are going to be marking Conor Callaghan? Um, we, we know pretty fast, I suppose. We had only a week turnaround for that game. So, I mean, we, we kind of do analysis on the Monday as a, as a Mayo Collective group and we, as we, uh, Chrissy discussed, that we have a diet in of dumb players and we don't, we're very conscious of the lads that are travelling the week of the game. So, we're pretty familiar with what our match is going to be from the Monday onwards, so it gives us time to do a bit of video prep, analysis, get yourself right for that guy. So we have we had plenty of time in terms of who we're going to match up with. Um, obviously, I got Conor Canlan, which is the uh, first time for me. Uh, you know, as he struggled, to be honest with you, uh, he gave me a hard time for, for protecting the second half, and he came out on top in terms of he was probably one of the biggest differences in terms of getting the goals at crucial times and set Dublin up for... Uh, for not an easy win, but I suppose the one by ten points then, so it, it, it probably looks it looks it looks like an easy win. But I mean, the, the, it was that twelve minute period where they just dominated. It. Um, I mean, if you think for Kerry this weekend, you know, we're talking about trying to get every match up right. It, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, I do think Kerry going to pose a lot of questions at the other end to Dublin defence, but I think I think Kerry have too many solutions to come up with in the time that Dublin have already answered every question that's been thrown at them. So um, I don't think. Dublin are going to be as worried as what Kerry defence are going to be because the likes of Khan, Paul Mannion, who is just having a sensational season, um, again, he's another fulcrum for them that had you pin him for, for 70 plus minutes. We did it for 35, 36, 37 minutes, but inevitably they're going to hit a purple patch and unfortunately we just couldn't handle that purple patch and that was basically the, the game in a nutshell when we played them. Uh, and again, I suppose we braced ourselves for that for that patch, but we I suppose we didn't foresee how damaging it was going to be at that time. So, in terms of matchups, is going to be key. Uh, Brian Fenton's obviously a key man for them. Uh, did they put David Moore or Jack Barry in them? Uh, do you start Tommy Wallace there? I, I don't know. Their questions are going to be answered pretty soon because. Um, if you take Fenton out of it, you know, we, we obviously we picked four or five of their key men, obviously Conor Cannon, Paul Mannion, Jack McCarthy, Fenton. Uh, if we didn't get them for as long as possible, we knew we'd be in the game or somewhere in the game. Um, we just couldn't hold them for long enough to keep ourselves in the game. And unfortunately, it was the likes of them guys that caused a lot of damage in that 12-minute patch in the semi-final. Lee, can I just go back to that 12-minute patch? Because um, it's, it was spoken about a lot afterwards because it was such a remarkable spell of football. Like, you guys had set the tone unbelievably well in that first half. The turnovers, the oxygen that went through the team, and you went in an, an amazing position at half-time. Dublin looked rattled. And, like, you guys knew it was coming. Like, everyone in the country knew what was coming in the second half. Why do you think you couldn't stop or even quell the tide for those 12 minutes? Because, you know, teams get purple patches in all games, but 2-6 in a purple patch, as you said, kills the game. Yeah, um, there was a bit of, I suppose, us that kind of, I suppose, fed into their their superiority a bit in that second half. As I think we had maybe two shots that dropped short. Um, we didn't give Robbie any platform for a kick out. We went into a complete kind of bubble where people were nearly afraid to look for the ball. Uh, I think Brian Fenton had a massive turnover in that patch as well. They went up, got a big score. So... Dublin did so much well, but we kind of fed into a lot as well where we just were doing kind of things that were giving them action and, and sucking from us. But again, in, in terms of that as well, they, when they were in their pomp, I mean, it, just, it was just so hard to stop. You're thinking to yourself, your head is kind of just spinning at the time, thinking there's runners left, there's yeah. right. Do you pick up this guy? Do you go to another guy? It was just, you just felt like it was never going to end. And I suppose <clears throat> eventually we did get a score to break up the mould. It was just too late. Uh, it, it's not a thing where I can just tell you where how to fix it. I, I, I don't know myself still, to be honest, because um, it was just 12 minutes of, I suppose, just complete dominance from Dublin, but a bit of silliness and naivety from ourselves probably as well. Um, so I'd be more inclined to look at what we could have done better to probably help in terms of get a platform from a kick out, could we do better on a shot selection uh, and then look at our maybe skeletal position as well. So a little bit from ourselves that could have <clears throat> negated some of that some of that madness in 12 minutes but I suppose again, 20 years ago you could have started a row 
Sorry? 20 years ago, you could have started a row. Yeah, could have started a row, um, potentially. I, I don't know. I suppose in the terms, of, in the time of the game, I, I suppose you're so conscious of your own man and trying to stop him. And for me, and you're obviously an icon, so he got two goals in the 12 minutes, so my head was spinning quite a bit of the time as well. So, um, yeah, I, I suppose we could have come up with probably different... It's just, I suppose we weren't expecting that dominance of 12 minutes. I, I said we were all waiting for it. We just didn't expect it was going to be that um, that critical, um, and obviously very disappointing because, as you said, we put ourselves in such a such a good position in the first half. We were we we're setting the terms. We lay down, I suppose, the tackle count, the turnovers, and um, we probably could have went in a bit more at halftime. If I'm being honest, um, yeah. we had a couple of shots straight off as well. So, um, I just and then after that, the twelve minutes went, and I suppose you look at you look to yourself and seeing how can you get back into this game. Um, and there probably was no way back at that stage. And um, Dublin kind of side the game in, in the fashion they do. They can they hold the ball so well. They've got their strike runners and they've got the, the damage up front that they can just tap over a couple of points when they need to. So we just left too much to do, and then we left ourselves to open and chase the game after that. So um, obviously bitterly disappointing because <clears throat> excuse me, as I said, we put ourselves in such a great position the first 35 minutes. It just got evaporated in 12 minutes. Need I say you need to put in a perfect performance up against <coughs> Dublin? You can't make errors here and there. Like, I'm not sure, is it is it kind of something you've thought about too much now, but what's going through your mind when that slip happens for you? Because ultimately you can get all the tactics right and then something bizarre like that can happen in a game and everything kind of feels like it's falling to pieces or what's going through your, your head at that point? All that went through my head is probably turn away to the crowd and not look and pray that it doesn't go in because mm. the, the wrong man for me got it in that position. <laughs> um, I, I knew that I'd come for him and got, I, you know, I got too tight to him and he kind of just slipped me and I slipped. But listen, can take nothing away from the finish. Um, absolutely brilliant. Uh, all I was doing is just trying to get the next ball. But I mean, at that time, actually, that was my first two championship goals conceded, which is unfortunate for myself as well. So um, they were the first goals you've conceded by a direct marker. Yes. Jeez. Because <laughs> unfortunately, there was a start a couple of years ago that you were you had outscored your marker five points to one in the 2016 championship. You marked Shane Walsh, Michael Quinlivan, and then obviously you had the Connolly battles at that time as well. So like that was that was something different for you. Yeah, and he brought a different, different dynamic. I mean, I suppose Khan is the type of player, and Kerry is going to identify that when he gets the ball, it's literally he's going to take on one on one any opportunity. And I suppose he realized at the time he got the goal that the juggler was there to be got it, and I was at a yellow as well. So, I mean, he did anything that any great forward is going to do. He's going to take me on in one on one position, and he did that, and everybody got the second goal then. So, I mean, for me as a uh, marker, literally disappointed. Uh, but at the end of the day, sometimes these are lessons that you have to learn. And, you know, I got I got a tough lesson that day in the semi final. Uh, and one that I'll go away with and work on. And, you know, listen, I, I'll have no hands and put my hand up that, you know, I, I, I was just a bit off. And next time I will have to be in a better position, get my footwork better, get my defending better. But listen, the things like the slip, they happen. Uh, that's just that's sport. It's, that's the cruel thing about sport. You, you're going to have moments like that. And you just have to hope that you might get a bit of luck along the way. We didn't, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I look forward to marking the likes of himself again. Uh, hopefully next year, if he on that goes. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be shying away from it in any way. Um, but for Kerry, uh, I think the likes of Khan and Paul Mannion, they're going to need serious watching. Uh, we were just saying after the game, like their movement and their pace and their directness is what causes so many defenders so much hardship. Uh, and then you throw in Paul Mannion shooting rate. I mean, he kicked five against us. Uh, he kicked five insanely good points. So I mean... You think yourself as a defender, how do you mark that? Um, yeah. And for me, too many teams probably try too many things leading up to the Dublin games and they take away from their own their own game plans. They're, just, they're still just too good, Dublin. The finances in, in every sector, like you, you look at Paul Mannion from, from left to right, he can shoot from 30 yards uh, from the Cusick side and it still stays over the black spot. So you think yourself, what game plan do you put in to, to negate that? So, um, I mean, they, they're just too many trumps and too many too many answers they come up with that uh, I guess I think Kerry might fall a little bit short there. I, I often wonder, and I, like this is the, the last question about the, the semi final. Like I often wonder if you're detailed to mark someone like your uncle Kenny, the way it'll be analysed is very different to how you would mark someone like Conor Callahan. Because as I say, if something bizarre happens, like a slip that happened for the first goal, back of mm. the net, you're the person who gets blamed. If you slip against your uncle Kenny. He goes around you, he perhaps starts to pass another player, creates an opportunity. Very rare would he be bearing down on goal. The same could probably go for your matchups with Dear McConley a little bit. There was that little bit more yeah. of leeway. So uh, I wonder, in essence, like, do you realise that, that the, the harshness with, with which you're criticised
advertising is, is just that little bit heightened because he's an inside forward and perhaps you out in the half back line was always going to be a better fit in terms of you going forward as well, kind of on a separate point. Yeah, I suppose in terms of half back, he always gets that bit more flexibility. So in terms of making a minor mistake, it doesn't lead to a major mistake. So as you said there, because I had a little slip in the full back line, inevitably it's the last side of the So any little costume mistake like that's going to lead to a goal chance or uh, or an every a goal uh, in my case it was it was two of them so um or what the first one sorry so of course uh, and of course the full back line will always be the ones in the fire line in terms of getting getting that blame but that comes to the territory i mean i i don't put my i don't hide away from it i mean i put my hands up i, I got caught for two sucker punches uh, and i have no beef about that whatsoever uh, for myself it's obviously very disappointing but sometimes you just have to give credit to, to your direct opponent and when he gets the better of you, so be it. You have to accept that. It's, it's part and parcel of, of GA. I mean, we, we always can't go out and get the, the better of our man, unfortunately, as much as we love to uh, and much as I pride myself in trying to, to, to mark the best and get the get, get, get one over that, the direct opponent. But, yeah. I mean, I suppose as a full-back, it's, it's inevitable it's going to happen once or twice where you're just going to get caught for a couple of sucker punches it's, it's, and then it's how we react. And unfortunately, in our case, we just couldn't react because I suppose the game was up at that stage so that's this point for myself and that's something I had to go away and think about it and work on myself but again you have to give massive credit to the guys that I was marking uh, they, they give Conor O'Connor them opportunities to take two goals and I, I can just say fair play it's when you talk about that when you look at the, the Kerry defenders when you look at the possible matchups this weekend it is hard to come up with a matchup for every single Dublin forward that you can actually give Kerry some sort of chance in what way are you <coughs> thinking on that front like who picks up Con? who picks up Mannion well, obviously, he's probably Thomas Sullivan's been their probably man, best man marker this year. You know, I, I've seen a couple of stats about him in the last couple of weeks, and we, we obviously we, we um, identified him as one of their best ball players and defenders when we played Kerry and Clarny. So I, I imagine he would be detailed to like, like probably Mannion, maybe, um, or even Khan, one other. And then obviously, it looks there, will it be Jason Foley, Ty Morley to pick up the other? Uh, these are the questions that were going to be asked. Um, obviously, Thomas Sullivan will be their key marker to, to mark on the rest forward. Um, Paul Murphy, another brilliant defender, will he will they put him inside to pick up one of them, uh, or do you take away from his game? And you know, obviously, he's very good going forward, good, very good on the ball as well. So, I mean, they're going to put him on Kenny, uh, which would be a great matchup as well to watch. And then, obviously, the biggest one for for Kerry for me is who marks Brian Fenton. Uh, you put David Moore in there and take away from his game and, and just just track or tag um, Brian Fenton, or do you give him a bit more of a free license and put Jack Barry or German O'Connor on Fenton and, and hopefully they can do enough of a job to negate his influence in the game. So, um, but then obviously up front, the biggest question I'd have as well for Kerry is how they utilise Stephen O'Brien. Uh, obviously, Stephen O'Brien is probably Player of the Year form at the moment, and he's demonstrated that minute one of the championship up to now so I mean did, did they put him on Jack McCaffrey and, and hopefully put him on the back foot or I told did they put um, Gavin White in that role again and tag McCaffrey that's going to be a big question for Kerry and uh, I suppose that's going to be one of, one of the big questions during the, uh, in the next two or three days of, of how they want to get their matchups right um, Like I think it's going to be a fantastic game in terms of some of the matchups I mean you're, you're looking at some of the best players in the country the weekend and as he carries inside line in, in terms of Clifford and Gini, like Dublin are going to have a lot of their hands full of trying to mark those two as well. So, I mean, you're going to have absolutely brilliant matchups on, on Sunday. And I think the game is really going to live up to his billing as, uh, as the best in uh, this year. I, I get the sense you're tipping Dublin, though. So, I'm going to ask you by how many, Lee? Um, I'm, I'm tipping Dublin simply on the fact that. They're going for five. They've answered all the questions in the finals in the, in the previous four. Um, for me, just and I said earlier, I think Kerry have too many answers or too many solutions to come up with in, in, in the three weeks. Um, um, I think they have one of the best forward lines out there, absolutely. And we 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 find that out in the in the Super Eight game uh, where the Taurus Taurus Sunders all together in terms of their movement. Um, but I just think Dublin have too much, too much experience, too much coming off the bench. Um, just their overall game uh, it can be frightful at times. Uh, and again, from playing both them this year. I think Dublin probably by four, five, six, pull up towards the end, maybe in the last 50 minutes where they pull up with that there. Um, but I think it's going to be, uh, I think Kerry going to just go full-blooded for it. Um, for the first 50, I just think Dublin just have too much gas and too much uh, too much in reserve to um, let, that, let the lead slip. So uh, probably Dublin by four or five for me. Lee, really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time this morning. It's been great chatting to you. Thanks many for taking the call. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Cheers, it. Lee. Thank you very much. Bye.